Welcome to You in HD, your identity in higher definition with Pastor Eric Miller. Join us in our journey of faith in God by taking an in-depth look into the Bible's authority and sufficiency to guide us in our Christian walk. Discover your identity in Jesus Christ today. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another Facebook Live Bible study. And of course, this is uh, streaming on YouTube. So I want to welcome any new viewers um, to YouTube. Um, today, we got we got to get right into it. We, we can't even waste no time. We got to get right into it because, well, we just do. Because of course, I'm late as usual. Uh, but I do have um, we definitely have a lot to discuss today. We definitely have to cross a lot. We have so much to discuss in so little time. So I will not go into my normal diatribe or segues. We're just going to get right into it from where we were before, which is, of course, in Galatians chapter 2. Now, just to catch up on everyone, we are at the point where Paul is now addressing Peter. Okay, he's now addressing Peter because Peter has did what most of us have done, which is fall back into fall into hypocrisy. He not only did that, he also did that by denying his own testimony because of peer pressure and true fear of the circumcision party. Now no one's uh no one's immune to uh, peer pressure some better than others some may be able to handle it better than others oops you could actually hear me in the background i'm so sorry um but the main thing that that i'm trying to get to sorry i'm a little distracted here trying to get everything set up because as usual it's unscripted so it's just we're just rolling with the punches as we go so remember i'm god the holy spirit does work I'm just here. So let's go ahead and see where Paul does the quote unquote unchristian thing by confronting Peter. Not only he didn't do it in private. He did it right. Oh, this is a little low. He did it right in Peter. Or in Peter uh, took it right to the chin. Paul was not playing games. Paul wasn't mixing words. He said flat out, I confronted him in his hypocrisy and the other Jews in their hypocrisy. So let's go ahead and get to that point. And we're going to start from verse 11, and then we'll end to 14. And we got a phenomenal, a phenomenal story today to deal in how God prevents hypocrisy in his household. One of the things that every human being on this earth will suffer with is being a hypocrite and someone that was a hypocrite toward you, okay? Remember, in, in, in Christianity, remember in the truth of God, in the truth of a Christian state, we are both perpetrator and victim. We can never cry innocence because we have also done things that is deserving of the wrath of God. However, by the grace of Christ and, by the, and through Christ, God's mercy is, is expressed, we now have we have an advocate. We can come to the throne of grace and plead our case. Say, Lord of the Father, I, I messed up. And as Christ pleads the case on our behalf, we know that God is faithful to uh, to forgive. So that's one of the great things that we get to enjoy about Christ is that he, he's definitely, he definitely 100% always active, always part of our lives, always present. So let's can, let's start with verse 11. And this is in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. And then we're going to go all the way down to 15, uh, verse 14. And we've got to stop there because if we go any further. Um, well, we, we, it might happen. So uh, let me quit. Lying. It might happen. Okay. So let's just try to go. We'll try to keep it at 14. So here we go. Uh, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I, this is Paul now, I opposed him to his face. Because he stood condemned for prior to the coming of certain men from James, 
he used to eat with Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, detached. He started having a discriminatory nature toward, toward Gentiles. Fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Barnabas is right hand dude. Barnabas got the right hand of fellowship with Paul. Now he's being carried away. He's struggling and in going into issues. So we got the whole, the, the whole gamut is being run right now. All these of the hypocrisy of the Jews is happening right here. And we see our first sign of it with religion. You know how much I detest, hate religion with everything that I am because God hates religion with everything that it is. Man-made wisdom belongs in one place, the toilet. It has no business being running parallel to God. It has no business standing with God. It has no business even circling with God. It is God's wisdom or man's folly. The, the two don't go together. They just never can. So we keep reading. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. His own road dog got carried away. Why? Because of the because of they feared the part of circumcision. But when I say that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you are being a Jew and live like Gentiles and not like Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Hypocrisy at its height. It's, it, here's the highest point of hypocrisy. And here's the good news. Well, it's not good news for Peter, but it's good news for us because we get to we get to see it firsthand. Peter didn't have an excuse to do this. This is where it, it, it's you can see where peer pressure got to Peter because Peter is someone he does have a reputation he is known to be a disciple of Christ and now an apostle his job we get to give some insight into that and he is to deliver the gospel to the circumcised to the party of the circumcision we know that because listen to this because when Peter when Paul went up to Peter went up to Jerusalem and met with the apostles this is where this is where the confirmation came from. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they and they to the circumcised. So we get to see a little bit of why Peter was a little afraid. I don't know if Peter was afraid because he was going to get stoned or he was, you know, he was worried about, um, you know, oh, I'm going these guys are going to just beat me down. And because he was seeing Stephen killed, knowing that he was martyred, stoned to death. I don't know. I can't say that Peter was was afraid of that, but I do think Peter was living, was trying to live up to his reputation. And I do believe that is where the, the, the really root of his hypocrisy comes from, because, you know, when you're someone, when you are somebody, you know, I got to lower this chair. This is ooh, hurting my back today. So when you when you are somebody, you have a reputation, someone will attach to you what you have been known for and, and what you've experienced. So it is now part of you. That's your reputation. And since the apostles that stayed behind, which the one that Jesus commanded, the 12 apostles, to stay in Jerusalem and, and preach the gospel to the circumcised, to the, to, the, to the lost tribes of Israel and those that are coming in, Paul was given the solitary task to go to the Gentiles, people like me, people like you, non-Jews, and this is Peter and James and John recognizing, yes, uh, Paul has been given the grace that is in Paul is the same grace that endowed us to be apostles. So they recognize him. So that way there's no frac there's no fractition. There's no there's 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 no beef really in the way. And let me tell you, 
in religion, causing beef and being in beef is standard operating procedure. Now, before I go any further, we got to discuss why religion sucks so bad. So let's listen to, this is Colossians chapter 2, verse 23. Now listen to this. So actually, you know what? That's not fair. We got to go back to verse 20 because we got to get to the context. Remember, it's like parallel parking. You got to go before and you got to go before and after. You got to well, go front, then rear, and then you put yourself in. That's how the Bible is interpreted. Okay, so listen to this. Since you died, as it were, with Christ, and this has set you free from following the world's ideas of how to be saved by doing good and obeying various rules, why do you keep on following them anyway, still bound by such rules as not eating, tasting, or even touching certain foods? Such rules are mere human teachings, for food was made to be eaten and used up. These rules may seem good, for rules of this kind require strong devotion and are humiliating and hard on the body. Listen to the important part that Paul states but they have no effect when it comes to conquering a person's evil thoughts, desires, and sins. They can only make him proud. So if you ever want to know why these preachers don't come out when, you know, when the scandal hits them, then they, they got to get out. Well, I just, I just didn't know, or I was just so caught up in the moment. The truth is, is what Paul just said and what the Bible says. Religion has never been able to stop a man from sinning. It has no capacity to do so. That's why anyone that is, is in participating in a religion, believing in a religion, trusting in this religion, thinking this religion gives them some kind of status, some status quo, or maybe they feel right, they feel more, more, they feel taller. They feel like, man, since I'm a Baptist, I, I'm, I can walk with my head held high. And no, it, it doesn't mean anything. And, and we just read it right there, right? What does it do? It only makes him proud. You can be Baptist of the year, Presbyterian of the year. You can be Roman Catholic of the year. You can be the Muslim of the year. You can be Mormon of the year. You can be Seventh-day Adventist of the year. You can stamp the religion in front. You can be Wiccan of the year. You can be Hindu of the year. Any of that, you can get personal praise. Because that's all religion does. It's for a man to try to achieve something to be recognized. However, when it comes to God, there's only one recognition. That's Jesus Christ himself. That's it. There is no Christian of the year because we know we're struggling. So we can't put ourselves on that pedestal. Because if we do, we're going to get knocked off just like you flicking flicking something off off your table and peter has no room to try to act like this he has no room remember when i said in the beginning before we started that peter has no excuse and we're going to see it and we're going to see you're going to see the see the bible teach us and tell us peter could not have been blind or ignorant to what's going on he couldn't done it he he cannot say, well, I just didn't know. I didn't get the memo. I wasn't on the Zoom meeting today. I was late. No, Peter absolutely knew that was going on with these Gentiles. And he chose to try to protect his reputation because he has to go to the circumcised and he doesn't want to have a bad reputation by eating amongst Gentiles because that was a, that was a law. You know, you didn't go into a Gentile's home because you couldn't eat meat sacrificed to idols. That's Leviticus 11. You could not participate in anything because if a Gentile had someone dead in their house, you can't go in that house or touch that dead body. You can't get around it. You can't even touch the guy that touched the dead body. So there was these rules that set the Israelites apart from the rest of the world. They were there to prove a point. And that point was that trying to to be righteous in front of God with all of these standards and rules that it would prove exhausting. That's what God has been teaching with the Ten Commandments since day one. It's not difficult to understand that. To stick to God's standard of living, no human being can do it. Are you telling me you can't lie anymore? Because if you lied once, the Ten Commandments doesn't matter no more. You already broke them. 
You telling me you've never you've never hated someone in your life? Well, the Bible says that's that's is that's equal to committing murder. So that's two right there out of ten. So you know if you if you can keep you can keep eight, but you lost, but them two you lost, you already failed in God's eyes. That's what the Ten Commandments does. It shows you and teaches you that no one is righteous in front of God, and God is the only one that can justify a man. And if God isn't discriminating against someone, we darn sure bet not be doing it. However, Peter definitely was on the Zoom meeting. We can prove he was on the Zoom meeting because we actually see things that he was doing. And like I said, it's best to prove this because the more you hear from me, it'd be like it's just like religion running its mouth. So I'd rather you guys to see for yourself how and what exactly Peter, why he couldn't plead ignorance. So we're going to go through some Bible verses. We're going to do some digging. So let's go ahead. So the first encounter, okay, the first encounter, the first encounter that we know for a fact that Peter knew that Gentiles were accepted is in Acts chapter 8, verse 14 through 17. You don't have to turn to it, but I, of course I would love for you to turn to it because reading the Bible is beautiful. So here we go at Acts chapter 8, verse 14 through 17. I'll keep it quick, but this is this is the first, first encounter. So this is the first evidence. Ooh, that's some bad English. This is the first time Peter witnessed and saw God not to be discriminatory to Gentiles. That's why there was a second Pentecost. That was the purpose of the second Pentecost. So that way they can see that it's not only just for the Jews, but salvation is also for the Gentiles. If you have a question on that, Isaiah 53. So let's go ahead and get, let's dive deep. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that, that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, two men that, Pete, that, that Paul met, as we just read in Galatians. So that's two of the two of the three apostles that Paul mentioned in Galatians. Listen to this. For he had, so who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Who's they? The Samaritans. As you always well know, that's where the Good Samaritan comes uh, story comes from. When it comes down to it, Jews and Samaritans were hated enemies. They just, because you had Jews that were <clears throat> the pure bloods, and then you had the Samaritans, bunch of Vin Diesels, you know, mixed heritage. Uh, they did have Jewish blood, but they also mixed with uh, Gentile blood, and they were holding to a form of Judaism. So there was a definite fight. It was definitely Cowboys and Indians. It's definitely Hatfield and McCoys. It's definitely Trump against Biden. It is Republican against Democrat. It's liberal. Well, we can keep going down that road, but you get the idea. Man against woman. It's that serious. So let's go ahead and keep going. So now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had yet, not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. They had John's baptism. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving, they're receiving the Holy Spirit. So now here's Peter touching Gentiles. He's laying hands on them. This is my brother. This is, hope you receive. And every time he laid his hand, the Holy Spirit entered in that person. So it was for them to see personally. I saw it. I witnessed it. Guys, I'm telling you, the Samaritans and the Gentiles are being saved. I was there and I watched it. So Peter can't claim that. Where's the second? Where's the second evidence? Here's the second evidence in Acts 10. OK. On the next day, as they were on their way approaching the city, Peter went up. Who's they? The apostles. When Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, but he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance and he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four footed animals, crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And verse 13, a voice came to him. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider it unholy. 
This happened three times and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in the mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. But get up. Go downstairs and accompany them without misgivings because I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? Verse 22, then said Cornelius, then they said Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you and to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. And on the next day, he got up and went away with them and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanying him. Here's the second clear evidence. So he not only allowed Gentiles coming to his home, fed them, clothed them, housed them. These are Gentiles now, Italians, Gentiles, okay? They're in a Jewish man's home. He had no issue with that because God said, don't, don't, don't get all hesitant now. These ain't Jehovah's Witnesses. These ain't Mormons knocking at the door. I sent these brothers. I don't want you to be nasty. Let them come on in and you'll be okay. You'll be all right, Peter. You'll be okay. And then, of course, Peter uh, finally accepted after three times because, you know, Peter was a knucklehead, much like all of us knuckleheads. So here we go. So now we have the second evidence that Peter was dealing with Gentiles on equal footing. Equal footing. And God made sure three times these men are okay. These men are okay. These men are okay. So it, we keep going. I know it's a little long winded, but we keep going. Acts 10, 28 through 29. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I asked for what reason you have to send for me. Now, here's Peter trying to sound pious. <laughs> you, you, We heard his objections, right? But here's Peter sounded... I didn't have any objections. Well, if we read back up, we heard him say, no, Lord, I can't. God had tell him three times. Here's Peter looking all pious, and the dude was objecting like crazy. So I find that pretty comical. And again, this is how God prevents hypocrisy. Because when God tells you to do something, you are to do it. There is no interpretation. There's, he was perplexed, right? And God didn't leave him that way. He came and told him, this is what is, needs to be done. What God calls holy, we can't call unholy. So that's twice. And even Peter admitted, I can't call Gentiles unholy. If God has done so, if God has, has made it to where these men are now clean, I can't call them ne negative against them. I can't do it. And so we have two points of evidence that Peter was not only going full bore with Gentiles. He wasn't only dealing with Gentiles on a daily basis. It wasn't just the fact that he had those three men coming to his home. He went to the Samaritans and was laying hands on them as they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So everything in Peter's testimony has said that he was living and running with the Jews. Peter was out playing ball. Peter was eating that golden corral. Peter was on all that was on all their Facebook groups. Peter was knee deep. Him and Gentile, they were on the same squad. They were playing three man pickup. He had no issues because he was in the will of God. And guess what? He was around. He was around fellow brothers, Gentiles. Finally, I can relax and be around my brothers, and we can we can we can just worship God together. Peter was not having a problem. They were. They were they was on a cooking channel. They were streaming together. There was no issues with the Gentiles. But lo and behold, 
Paul, Paul said there's a problem. Paul said there's a problem. We never read that problem, but let's go back and go there. Let's get back there before time gets away from me. I'm sitting at 24 minutes. I'm actually making better time than I probably ever have, but it's probably going to get extended because you know me. So let's listen to this. So we now go to Galatians chapter two again. But when Peter came to Antioch, verse 11, I had opposed him publicly, speaking strongly against what he was doing because it was very wrong. For when he first arrived, he ate with Gentile Christians who don't bother with circumcision and many other Jewish laws. But afterward, when some Jewish friends of James came, he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore because he was afraid of what these Jewish legalists who insisted that circumcision was necessary for salvation would say. We got proof that Peter was afraid because his reputation was going to get tarnished and Peter could not sustain on his own. See, that's the thing about God. When you follow God, there is no extra backup at the time when you're going to be defending him. See, religion, like wolves, hunt in packs. This is what they do. I know I was, I was a wolf for many years, 27 years to be exact. Everything, I ruined my marriage. I've ruined many friendships. I, I've, I've left many jobs. I was a mercenary, hired gun. All I cared about was money and satisfying my own urges. So I, I know exactly what it is to be a hypocrite. Absolutely, hands down, all day and twice on Sunday. However, I'm not gonna defend myself, I'm just saying, however, when you stick with God, it is your testimony that is your backup. Because the minute you, you bow down, the minute you succumb to the culture, you now compromise what God has done for you. And it happens all the time. I've always said this, I respect atheists more than I respect people in religion. Because at least the atheists will say, no, nah, I don't like that. I don't believe that trash. And guess what? They're right. Every atheist known to man that ever existed is right about religion. Flat out. Wrong about God, but 100% flat right on religion. And you know the thing that I've said it before? You know, human beings know a scam when they smell it. You know, religion is nothing more than that call that comes in and says, your car's warranty is about to expire. No different than that. It's the same difference when you pick up and you, you're on the website, you're watching the NFL game or you're, you know, pirating some, you know, sports game, things of that. Um, you you come across a, a pop up and it tells you, oh, well, your, your, your uh, computer's compromised. Call this 1-800 number and you call it. And that's religion. Just to just cut it out, that's what religion does. It tries to compel you and tell you, you need this in order for your salvation to look and appearance that what we design. It's all that religion has been doing since day one. Religion, and I've been saying it, and I've had been, I don't know how many times I've been uh, struck down on, on, on Instagram and I had to fight to keep my, my account up. Religion are spiritual child molesters. That's what they do. They are rapists of the spirit of men because what they do is they rip every bit of hope that is written on humanity and they try to stash it into their compact little dirt pile and, and keep you in there. That's all they are. They're slave masters. It's all it, it's all it has been. I just call it like I see it. it. It's the truth. God has never supported religion. Never. You will never find one Bible verse from Old Testament to New Testament when God says religion is fine. You will find the exact opposite. You will find him condemning it. Jesus had no respect of religion. He did that. He was eating on the Sabbath day because they had made the Sabbath day for them when God is the one that made the Sabbath day for man. So they tried to hijack and... Christ says, "Man, go ahead and uh, go ahead and get go ahead and get me some bushel over there, and get me some figs, and uh, bring me some water on, a, on on Saturday, which would have gotten most people stoned to death." But but Jesus was saying, "I ain't got no respect for this. This is this is nothing. I didn't I didn't bring any of this." That's when people tell me I'm not very religious. I say, "Well, that's good news because neither is Christ. He ain't, he ain't down for religion either." And religion does one thing really well. I got to give them credit for it. They can be very intimidating. 
That's why you got people like me, the bully. The bully that's, that will push back against religion, saying, you you cowards ain't going to take none of the people I know. You ain't just, I've, I don't know how many times I've defended uh, my atheist brothers, my agnostic brothers, and I, I was 27 years. I ran with, I know what they're feeling. I know what's going on in them. So I'm, I'm more apt to protect them than I am a religious guy. Because religious guy, he's already bought, he's already bought that, that Brooklyn Bridge. He's already, he's already bought the snow to sell to Eskimos. He's already been, he's already been lied to. And he's accepted that lie. And that's where the peer pressure comes from. So as we get, so I don't, I segue, I'm so sorry, but I did. So as we now know what Peter was going through, because here's people that, and remember him, James and John, Paul met them. Okay. So that means when Peter was in Antioch and he saw these brothers that was in, that was the circumcised and they were friends of James, he probably said this, man, I don't want to get back that, uh, I was acting outside and these brothers are good with James and James was the, probably the closest you can get to a legalist that, but his was, he was hundred percent correct on what he was saying. So, um, when we deal with that, we can really get an idea that Peter was like, well, maybe, I don't want to upset James's boys because you know they 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 James's boys they might go back and say man this Peter guy he wouldn't come eat with just the Jews he was eating with Gentiles and then all of a sudden that might cause a rift I really don't know what Peter was thinking but I can tell you this much he dipped into hypocrisy and got completely wet one of the guys that I in, in boxing that I love to death I cannot remember his name right now but he's passed on he used to he said a he made a, a he said a, a line or a quote. And I don't know where he got it from, but it's amazing. He says, swim without getting wet. And you're like, what? That means if you're going to deal with people and you're trying to rescue folks out of the world and you're trying to rescue people out of religion, you can dabble in it. By mean dabble means you can go, you can go on their home, you can go to their home court. You can be the visiting team. You can do whatever you got to do to get to them, but you cannot participate in the reindeer games. You just, you can't do it. You will be carried away. So again, here's our third evidence of Peter knowing full well that what Paul is confronting him on, he's guilty of. Because remember I said when Peter got to Antioch, that's verse 11 in Galatians 2. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had opposed him, him, him uh, to his face publicly, strongly against what he was doing. Well, guess what? We can go to Acts chapter 11. Stay with me now, 19 to 26. It's a long ride, but the walk is good. Listen to this. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in the connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews alone. So here's Peter and the rest of the, the, rest of the Jews that were sent out because they were scattered because after Stephen got stoned to death, which guess what? Paul was at that pro was at that process. Paul was there when Stephen was stoned. He was holding the coats. Remember that. So Paul is very, very, very acquainted with Peter. He knew him. I wouldn't say he knew him like on a first name basis, but he definitely said that's that Peter, that darn disciple of Christ. If I can get my noose around his neck, I'd hang him high. Listen to this. So when those were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. Verse 20. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Serene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, also preaching the Lord Jesus. So now you have two ethnic groups. Okay. Sirens, you know, were, were brothers. And you also have, you know, you have men of Cyprus, which, of course, they, they, there was some mixed blood in there, too. You know, mostly Jewish, but there was there was some converts in there and they have now been saved. But there are some of them, men of Cyprus and Serene. Serene is known for being a convert. A lot of the brothers there were known to be uh, converts to Judaism. But listen to this. These are now saved men who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also preaching the Lord Jesus. Because remember, Christ told the apostles to preach to the Gentiles. I mean, Gentiles, to the circumcised. But these men, these are disciples. They can preach to the, they can preach to the circumcised 
as well as the Gentiles that are, under, that are under that cause. So they can go out and preach and teach the gospel to Greeks. Verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. This is further proof that these men is sanctioned by God and says, I'm good with their brothers right there. Let them do what they're doing. I, 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 I give them the kiss, my blessings. Let them get out there and do what they got to do. So we see that and the Lord is, is blessing them and they're preaching and teaching to the Greeks and Greeks are believing. Okay, listen to this. Then when he arrived, who's he? Peter, and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. Here's Peter the third time. This is the third, this is the third evidence put against him. If he was on the testimony stand, the, birth, the prosecution would be ripping him apart. And that's what we're doing right now. So listen to this. He witnessed it. He witnessed those Gentiles being preached to the gospel. He watched those Gentiles get saved. And then he rejoiced. He witnessed it. Then he was celebrating. He was happy. And then he encouraged them. Here's the hypocrisy now. He encouraged them to, make, to be resolute of heart, to remain true to the Lord. And yet we find Paul tearing his bacon up in verse 14, Galatians 2. But when I saw that they were not straightforward, they weren't being resolute. And they weren't being straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Yet here's Peter saying, remain true to the Lord. Be resolute in heart. Now he looks like a hypocrite. Now Peter's looking straight like a hypocrite. And three times as the Lord told him to go to Cornelius' house, we now see three clear evidences that Peter knew what he was doing should was going to be wrong. Hanging out with Gentiles, eating with them, telling them have resolute of heart, remain true to the Lord. He was encouraging them. He was giving out Gatorade. He was giving them high fives. He was slapping them on the backside. He was in the huddles. He was doing everything he could to encourage the Greeks to keep moving. He was excited for them. He rejoiced. And here he is in verse 14. Now, pulling himself back. Oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I know Rollo, but uh, yeah, I'm going to go hang with my brothers. Hypocrite. Because that's what religion does. It causes hypocrisy. Because with religion comes that false reputation that you try to hang on to that God has destroyed. You became lesser as Jesus Christ became more. It's just pretty simple. Listen to this, verse 24. And he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith and considered and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left Tarsus to look for Saul. What, what do we got? What do we have here? What, what am I getting to? And where, well, it's pretty simple what I'm getting to. Peter could not, should not, and never should have tried to stand back from the Gentiles. Never should have happened. But yet we do this very same thing. We who are saved do this every time we join religion. Every time we want to listen to an amen or theologian. Every time we support one of these, this is man-made wisdom. We are being hypocrites if we're saying we're following God and yet raising up these false, these, this false wisdom of men saying that, well, maybe it's just as equal to God. And all we have to do, and you know, people are going to say, I didn't say that, Eric. I did not say that that religion was equal to God. Yes, you did. Because if you joined them and you was hanging out, eating all that food and was enjoying yourself with them because you were so afraid of standing with those that didn't have a religion. Men and women like me who do not succumb to anything that's of ordinance of men. All of a sudden, when you get around the, the fellow Baptists and Presbyterians and Reformed, you know, all of a sudden now your reputation's at, at play. You have something to lose. I don't want to be known as, 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 as the, the, the guy on the outside. Here's Peter that every one of us 
every Christian, if you are truthful to yourself, we've all did what Peter did. We do it by race. Oh, I'm going to hang out with my brothers, even though all my friends are white, all my friends are Hispanic, and I'm hanging out with them every single day. But then when a pack of brothers come in, I start to pull myself away from them and be around my, my brothers and, and that are black and, and their skin is brown. No different than Peter. Hypocrite. Hypocrite. Plain and simple. Because once again, religion has no power to prevent a man from sinning. Let's go ahead and go this and I'll let you guys go. Listen to this. These are matters. Remember that we talk about the commandments of men. We got to go to verse 22, which all refer to uh, things that are destined to perish with use. Okay. He's, ta he's talking about uh, what you what don't eat, don't taste, don't touch. Things that God has said, this is clean. You can go ahead and eat. You can eat all the pork you want. You can eat pork and date all the white women you want. Okay. Now, you can't have sex with them. You can't do any of that, but you can date who you want. You can date whoever you want. Go go for it. You can't do anything crazy. And you can't lead them on. You can't lie. You can't do it. But see, when you're putting yourself out there, listen what religion does. For these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence how many times does the bible have to tell you what wisdom what man-made wisdom does is nothing it can't help at all it never will help it will never it, propel you to the heights of righteousness it'll never do it it'll do the opposite it'll convince you that you're better than you are and you'll surround yourself with a bunch of hypocrites and they'll all, we'll, they'll all be around. I'll say we all be around just patting each other on the back, slapping each other around, saying, hey, man, good job, brother. You did a great job with that, that sermon that was a, a Baptist sermon. But the minute I stand out, things change. All of a sudden, now I'm not invited to the reindeer games. And if I am invited, I can't show up. Because people go think, oh, Les Eric, he's lending his hand to religion. He just compromised his whole testimony. And that's what Peter was doing. That's why Paul had to do that in his face. He had to confront him in his face in order to prevent his testimony and God to be, from being abolished. And that's what Peter was doing. He was selling it short. I'm just keeping it real. This is the Bible keeps it real. Everything I just said to you today, you can research for yourself. And that's one of the beautiful things about that's how God prevents a hypocrite. If you just tell the truth of his word, everything else gets easier. But the minute you want to stray out on your own, well, I think my opinion on this situation should be you just you just you just walked into the pit of hell. Happens all the time. And I get it. You you you. You, you want to be part. You, you're, you don't want to be Rudolph all the time. I get it. You don't want to be the guy on the outside, the girl on the outside. But that's where God pulled you. He says, I called you out from that so you can never return to it. And you will be a light for others to say, man, I'm going to go stand with that guy. That's exactly what Peter was celebrating. Right there. And then, of course... We, we go right into it where in Galatians when Paul said the same dude that was celebrating and encouraging the Greeks is now trying to say, well, I don't want to hang around them no more because, you know, I, I'm more afraid of what the Jewish men will say about me. It's not going to work, man. It doesn't work. So, guys, I'm going to cut it there because I can go more and more, but I got to let you go. I'm glad for everybody tuned in. I'm glad for those that support this ministry. Um, I would not have survived this long without your prayers, your consideration, and things of that nature. I just thank you very much for everything you do for this ministry. Um, I pray to God that if this, this ministry helps you, share it, like it. Um, I just, just, just if it, if it, if it moves you and it and, and it speaks to your soul, don't be afraid. Share it with someone that that you're thinking of that that God has laid on your heart. If you don't know God, this is a good time to understand and know who He is. Because let me tell you something: what religion, the, the God of religion, is 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 phony as as is trying to say that styrofoam cups are real.
they they remade a real material. It's all fake and plastic. The God of the Bible and the God of religion are not the same. And God has pulled us out of the world and set his seal upon us so that we can be those beacons of light, not putting men back into slavery, which religion does. So I love you very much, guys. I will see you probably this weekend. I got some things. We got to go over the church fathers. We got to talk about them anti-Semitic anti racists. Because you know, Ed, with you know, you know, you know the thing. Religion loves to hold up their men of power. Man, I'm yanking all their cards, and I'm going to. And I'm going. They're going to say it themselves, so that way you can see they're liars. So I love you very much. I will see you soon. I'm praying for you in Jesus' name. Amen. You have just listened to you in HD. Your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.